uh, a <laughs> recorded workshop, as you'll get an alert for right now. Um, this is part of our offerings around getting ready for reappointment and continuing appointment. And this is documenting your teaching effectiveness through your teaching portfolio. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, either is fine. I'm a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL. I'm going to pass it over to uh, my co-presenter, Mary Catherine, to uh, introduce herself, and then she will pass it to our next person. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Catherine Stumbos. I'm a, also a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL, and I'll pass it on to Priya. Hi, everybody. My name is Priya Doshi. I go by she, her, and I am the Associate Dean of Faculty and Inclusive Excellence um, in the office of the Provost. Welcome. All right. So we're going to begin with a warm-up question. So please feel free to share in the chat. How comfortable are you with putting together a teaching portfolio? And what do you want to know about teaching portfolios? And it's okay if you just focus on one of these questions, but we would like to hear from you how comfortable you feel working on it, whether that's very comfortable or you feel like you're totally new to the process and what you want to know about it, which uh, we may be covering, will likely be covering today. So go ahead and take a minute to share in the chat. All right, so we've got some thoughts, folks asking about what kind of templates or ways to sort of measure our submissions. Um, yeah, maybe we're still not sure what we're doing. Um, yes, this workshop is going to include some uh, bulleted lists and options for what you can include in your portfolio. Um, word count, definitely we're gonna talk about. Um, yeah, as some folks feel more comfortable, which is great to hear. But if you feel totally new, you're in the right place as well. We're going to review uh, a lot of that information. Um, yeah, and so some of these questions, I think uh, we are going to, some of them we're definitely going to answer today. Others one, Other ones, I might ask Priya to address, if that's all right, Priya, uh, as they come up. And so please feel free to keep sharing your questions uh, through the session. Um, yeah, anything that you notice, Mary Catherine? All right. Okay, so if you haven't shared, please do, but thank you to those who did share in the chat. I wanna start with some guidelines for participation for this workshop. This is something that we do at the start of all of our workshops. Um, throughout this workshop, we ask that you first make yourself comfortable in the way that works for you. So that might be stimming, rocking, fidgeting, knitting, crafting, etc., cetera, um, as needed. So um, whatever is going to help you feel engaged and present, which is to participate in activities in a way that works for you. So we're going to have some reflective moments or some interactive moments. We hope that you'll engage. You know yourself best and what you need. So go ahead and do what's going to work for you today. Please do ask questions or share ideas in the chat as we move along and then be generous with your knowledge. You know what, what you might know, tips or strategies you would like to share with others and respectful of others knowledge that they bring to the conversation. Just want to point out quickly that this is a sort of meta moment for us because we uh, suggest similarly setting these sorts of guidelines with your students and making sure that they know what's expected of them in a class and even co-creating those guidelines with them. So if you want to learn more about that, we have a lot of resources about that online and in a lot of our workshops. But just pointing out, this is a practice that we like to do for transparency, and that is a great pedag pedagogical practice as well. Okay. Just keeping an eye on the chat. Okay. So Learning outcomes for this session. By the end of the session, you'll be able to first reflect on the purpose of developing a teaching portfolio. Why make one? Describe the components of the portfolio at AU. Develop a plan to document evidence of self, peer, and student assessment and other materials relevant to a teaching portfolio. And then identify key examples of currency in the field and service as part of the omnibus requirements. And here is our agenda before we really dive into things. We're going to start with a teaching portfolio overview. I want to note that the CTRL supports teaching portfolio work and 
things that you write related to teaching, that's our area of expertise. Whereas I'm going to pass it over to Priya to talk about components like the comprehensive narrative. So we'll start with the components and process of creating teaching portfolios. Priya is going to talk about currency in the field and service as parts of your comprehensive narrative. And then we're, CTRL folks are going to talk more about teaching statements and options for assessment items. So that includes options of self, peer, and student assessment. Please keep in mind that some of your questions we are going to definitely answer. <laughs> Many of your questions we will answer along the way. So please hold on to your questions until we get to the appropriate section um, and share them. And we are really happy to address them as we move along. All right. So let's start with this question of what is a teaching portfolio? And we're gonna talk about the purpose, the components and the process of building out your teaching portfolio. Let's start with purpose. I'm gonna ask folks to answer this question in the chat. What comes to mind for you? Why create a portfolio? What is the purpose of creating a teaching portfolio? And there's more than one. So let's see what we can think of. All right, so we have a thought, monitoring the progression of your teaching over the years, absolutely excellent, keeping track of your own growth, uh, showcasing your accomplishments, philosophy, room for growth, also great. I love this, embracing the mindset of continuous improvement, absolutely. It's an important way for us to know what we're doing and what we want to do in the future, um, because we don't just get great at teaching and then stop learning. It's a process that's always ongoing, improving our teaching. Elaborate on your strengths. These are great. Uh, demonstrate and document effectiveness from a variety of metrics. Uh, measuring progress and experience. These are all really wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so I think we captured a lot of those. Um, of course, for what you are likely focused on right now, which is tenure promotion and job applications. And then also we have benefits like record, record of teaching effectiveness, right? Documenting how you have been an effective instructor and how your strategies and uh, philosophies of teaching have worked. Uh, reflecting on your teaching and refining your practices. So doing that reflection is the most important way to improve as an instructor by looking back on what you did and assessing whether it was effective and whether to keep doing it or change it. Tracking your development as a teaching professional over time. And of course, sharing a public representation of you as a teacher with students and colleagues. So um, when you are submitting, a, a teaching portfolio. Um, we want you to keep in mind in terms of AU submission that there are different possible formats. You can submit a continuous PDF document where everything is a PDF in one, one file, or you can combine PDFs and links of larger media files that you want to share in the portfolio. Whichever way you choose to do this, the main thing we want you to remember is that everything should be named consistently for ease of the readers um, and just to keep things organized. So please keep that in mind when you are formatting your documents. And just to highlight here that uh, teaching statements are useful or teaching portfolios are useful in process and product. They are useful for us to submit for things like tenure promotion reappointment or job applications or whatever else, but they're also useful in making them. Making them is an important practice for us. So what are these components of this portfolio in, at AU? So we're going to start here with the comprehensive narrative, which, as we said, we're going to talk about more in a little bit. And that includes an overview of teaching, service, and currency in the field. It should also include an updated CV and then the teaching portfolio itself. 
So here are the components of the portfolio. We've got a teaching statement that we're going to talk about, and that's where you expand on what you said about teaching in the comprehensive narrative. So sharing more about your teaching than what you include in the comprehensive narrative. Then you have supporting materials, and there are some helpful graphics that we'll also share later about compiling these materials. So if you are uh, aiming for promotion, you would include all three of these types of supporting materials. If you are aiming for reappointment or continuing appointment, you will include just one from these categories. So we have self-assessment, peer assessment, and student assessment, and we'll also talk more about that in a minute. And then SCT numerical scores. So you do not do anything for these. These are generated by OIRA um, and they will provide them to your department and your department provides them to you. Uh, so we'll also talk a little more about that. A note here is that one size does not fit all. So we are gonna give you the guidelines that we have, right? But that each unit has discretion about some of the details or formatting or expectations. So every department, school and field is going to be different, which is why it's really important to communicate with your unit and ask them what they expect of you and to defer to their judgment when it comes to the components. Um, and I'm not sure how to answer this question in the chat. Um, uh, is it just one for reappointment uh, or is just, uh, and I can two? answer that. Shad. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Um, so, yeah. So just for this academic year, you are, and if you're just going for a reappointment and continuing appointment without promotion, you can do a, um, what we call an abridged teaching portfolio. So for the 23-24 year, only for a reappointment and continuing appointment without promotion and only for term faculty, um, can you do um, basically the components that you see here and then where it says supporting materials, you choose one of those. Um, but if you are going either for promotion as a term faculty member, or you are on the tenure track or tenured, you must do a full teaching portfolio. Okay, thank you for that, Priya. Good question. So let's talk about the process of creating a portfolio, sort of overview of that. So the sort of um, what might come into our heads or a sort of more traditional way of assembling a portfolio, like assembling other sort of materials would be start by developing your teaching statement. The statement is where you um, present your philosophy, your beliefs and values about teaching, how you make those real through actions, and then how you know they're effective with evidence. Then gathering and selecting the evidence and artifacts to support the teaching statement and arranging and organizing them. We want to suggest here, and as always when it comes to teaching and pedagogy, is a sort of cyclical or an iterative process where you are con we are constantly sort of improving it, right? And so it's not the kind of thing we can really uh, put together in a weekend. It takes a lot of time to put a teaching portfolio together because it involves a lot of iteration, improvement, reflection, editing. Um, it's ongoing. So we might start <laughs> kind of anywhere in this process. Really, it's up to you and where you want to begin. But if we're going to say we're going to start with writing a statement over here on the top right, and then gather evidence, and then write summaries of what we have, and then maybe gathering more evidence or arranging and organizing, right? So we keep sort of collecting. And for this reason, portfolios should be a sort of living document. They should change over time, you know, they probably should not stay the same for more than a year or two at a time because our teaching is changing over that time as well if we're actively teaching. So we want to emphasize that this is an ongoing process of continual editing and improvement. So it's going to take some time to develop a portfolio. All right, I'm going to pass it to you, Priya, to talk about currency in the field. Thanks so much, Shed. Um, okay, so we talk about these various components of your overall uh, narrative, right? So Shed's talked you through a little bit of the teaching piece of that, but then you also have currency in the field and service. So what is currency in the field? Simply said, it's just staying up to date with one's professional or scholarly areas. And so as part of this, and this comes from the omnibus guidelines, which many of the schools have adopted, or um, if your school has not adopted omnibus, it has its own set of guidelines, which actually are quite aligned 
with this anyway, but we ask that you demonstrate one or more of the following things. So either you can demonstrate how you're conducting research publishing or contributing to your to the scholarly profile of the university. We ask you um, to you know consider uh, talking about your professional practice. So say, for example, your consulting work or your work with professional organizations or disciplinary organizations, um, participation in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So attending sessions such as this one that are geared toward improving your ability as a scholar and a teacher. Um, those are things that we would be looking at, as well as your participation in other kinds of conferences. Um, and then pedagogical innovation. So anything you can talk about that you've done in terms of your syllabi or your assignments to, um, to be more creative and innovative, um, especially things that are aimed at increasing access and inclusivity um, are positive things that you want to mention. Um, we also want you to talk specifically about your contributions to the development of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racist practices, specifically um, in terms of what you've done and with the impact of that in terms of building community and collaboration and civil discourse within your field. Um, so this is also an effort to recognize what until now many have called um, and still unfortunately can remain invisible labor. Um, so the omnibus guidelines and the new tenure promotion reappointment guidelines for tenure track and term in each discipline are really um, now in, uh, interspersed with an emphasis on making sure you are talking about your DEI contributions. So while it may not be um, completely mandated, we definitely recommend that you do speak about these things and talk about how it how it affects your, your teaching. And so the tip that I've provided below is, you know, you really want to talk about how these activities enrich your teaching your student advising and your mentoring, the kind of the so what of your currency and how it makes you into a better, um, a better scholar and teacher. Next slide, please. Okay, and then service. So service obviously is a required component for all full-time faculty, and it is something that is um, of particular uh, relevance for term faculty where you know, you're know you measured first on your teaching and then your service. Um, so service should be considered at the teaching unit level, meaning your department, um, your academic unit, so your school, um, and the university as a whole. And then within that, we have internal and external service. So as you're thinking about internal service, you can think about kind of different levels of involvement. So things that are relatively low lifts, like, you know, attending preview days or events uh, that bring students to campus or celebrate students like graduation, for example, but also things then that are sort of more mid-level, mentoring and advising students, writing letters of recommendation to more, um, more involved things like serving on task forces, either within your within your unit or um, within the universities, uh, within the university, and then serving on committees as well. So like think about faculty senate committees, for example, they're often looking to refill positions um, that become vacated in faculty senate committees. That's a great way to show service. Um, and with your service, you really want to think about service matching your level of years here at the university. So we really like to see service um, commitments showing um, greater scope, um, not necessarily that you have to load up service the longer you're here, but that your, your responsibilities in service, your impact in service, if you can talk about how that's been developed over time, that's actually really valuable. Um, and then just a point around external service. So again, recognizing invisible labor, many of you may do work in the community, or you may be doing work in your professional fields, either pro bono or even for compensation. And so some of the work that you're doing, particularly if it's community serving work, and even if it's paid, can also count as external service. Um, so here I've also provided you with the tips of making sure that you're highlighting your increasing impact or um, levels of service and that you're also talking about the time commitment and depth of involvement. So you really want to highlight, for example, if you're in a leadership position, if you're a chair, or if you're a faculty advisor to a student group, and the number of activities you're involved in. Because often we'll do a laundry list of service, and there isn't real a context around what that means. And for somebody who's reviewing your file, they may not understand the depth of what you've been involved in. And so that's something I would really emphasize. Um, and then lastly, um, in, in the interest of making sure that we're highlighting um, DEI and inclusive of excellence, we want to highlight service that's especially um, that's, that's especially been beneficial for underserved groups at the student, faculty, and community level. And I think I'm turning it back to, am I turning it over to you or to? Yeah. To yeah. All right. Thank you for that, Priya. 
So um, let's do a quick chat check-in. Um, what words would you use to describe your goals as an instructor? And we're going to use this to inform uh, our next segment where we talk about teaching statements. So what are some words that you would use? Love that. Inclusive and engaging. Generative. Yeah, absolutely. Empowering. I love that. I would say for me, empathy and trust are very important as part of my, uh, well, that's not necessarily, well, it is a goal. It's a more values, creative, authentic, love hearing that inspiring, um, connected, inspired, empowered. These are really wonderful. Um, interesting. Yeah. Like engaging, keeping class engaging and getting students engaged in the field. That's wonderful. So please feel free to keep sharing. These are some <laughs> cool, <laughs> I'm a cool teacher. Yeah, professional competence, identifying paths of success. These are all um, values or goals that can really anchor your teaching philosophy or your teaching beliefs that you put in a statement. So let's look at some details about the teaching statement. So teaching statements are your chance to describe your goals as an instructor. So what makes you the instructor you are? It shouldn't be the same as anyone else's. There is no right one answer. It's what you believe about teaching and what your goals are that make you the instructor who you are. It's the foundation of your portfolio. One way to think about it is the teaching statement is sort of like an abstract of the portfolio and all of the other documents are supporting um, or sort of, you know, they're proving the sort of thesis put out by or the argument made by the teaching statement. So um, it is sort of the central document. They are typically one to two pages, single spaced, between 500 and 1200 words to fit within your comprehensive narrative. The amount of words that you include depend on your goal and rank. Um, and Priya, do you mind talking about that for just a second? Yeah, sorry, I was answering something in the chat. Could you repeat what you wanted me to ask to talk about? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, if you could say some, just a quick something about the amount of words in for the uh, teaching statement, depending on goal and rank. Yeah, sure. So as you probably know, that you, in the comprehensive narrative, you do have very strict word limits, depending on what level you're applying for. Um, but the teaching statement, um, you're talking about the teaching statement as a component of the overall narrative, right? You want to make sure that that's some portion of it. So I would say like, if you have, if you're going for a one year reappointment on the term side, you have a 1000 word limit for your whole thing, meaning your teaching currency and service. So in that case, you'd want to run shorter on the shorter end of this. And, um, and also, if you feel like you have a lot on the currency and the service, giving that enough um, word count space. But if you're going for a multi-year reappointment, you have 2,250 words, I believe it is, 2,250 words. Um, and then I believe it's 3,000 words for tenure track, so um, for tenure, tenured rather. So, um, so you want to kind of do it as a proportion of what your total word count is. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense, uh, the way you said it about proportions, Priya, uh, for me. Thank you. <laughs> and let us know if that makes sense to you. Um, uh, note here is that teaching statements are always in the first person. They should be using I statements, um, regardless of the discipline that you're coming from, whether your discipline typically uses passive or active voice, you should be using active voice because it's your story and you're talking about your choices and values. So you should be saying, I teach in this way. I believe in the sort of pedagogical goals. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. Um, if anyone can look at those while I'm working on this slide. Yeah. Um, and so finally, teaching statements are an opportunity to elaborate on and acknowledge yourself for all that you do as an instructor. So we have a question about... Uh, is this slide about the section of the comprehensive narrative that deals with teaching or is it about the teaching statement within the portfolio? Um, these are, yes, let me know if I'm answering this correctly, Priya. These are two different, uh, these are two uh, writings about teaching that are in two different places in the portfolio. Does that sound right to you? 
Yeah, that's right. So you have the teaching portion of the comprehensive narrative, right? So the comprehensive narrative is going to include teaching service and currency. That's the thing with the word count. Somebody was asking about a two-year reappointment that would probably be a thousand words total. Um, and for continuing appointment, it is the 20, it's 22, 2,230. 30 or 2,250 rather words um, total for that. Um, so, and then the other piece that Chad's talking about is separately outside of the comprehensive narrative, you have a teaching statement. Now for the teaching statement, you have a few choices. You can either take what you've written from your com in your comprehensive narrative about teaching and you can take that out and you can build on it, right? Or um, you can do something that's a little bit different and you can focus it more on sort of your philosophy and your goals around teaching. But I would be cautious. I would caution you that you should not put stuff into your teaching statement that's not also mentioned in some way in your narrative um, in the teaching component. And the reason I say that is because if a reviewer is reading your file and reading a ton of files quite quickly, you don't want them to miss something essential that you want to say about your teaching if they've spent more time reading your comprehensive narrative than they have reading your teaching statement. I hope that makes sense, and I, I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Hey, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I want to, uh, we had a good question. Yes, we will share slides from this session um, over email in our follow-up. Um, the question about bullet points is a good one. Um, Priya, do you have thoughts about that one, about bullet points? Um, the use of bullet points, I'm going down to the question. Bullet points aren't bad. I mean, it's a good way to explain things, but I would also, also like want you to kind of um, provide some context around the bullet points. So rather than the bullet points kind of appearing just as a list, you know, maybe sort of saying, here are some examples or here are some evidence of X that I'm trying to illustrate, right? So that you're providing that in a more evidentiary way. Or I would say if you're going, going to do... Um, if you're if you're going to do bullet points, you might want to like infuse it as part of like a narrative, because, you know, from the point of view of reviewers, too, if it's just a bulleted list, they kind of lose focus. But if they understand what it means inside of a larger story, I think it's a little bit more beneficial to you um, as a person being evaluated. So we have more, thank you for that, Priya. We have more questions in the chat just to make sure we cover all of our um, our uh, slides. Um, I, we, oh, thank you, Mary Catherine is already answering questions in the chat. So we will make sure to look at them in the chat as well um, and make sure we answer them. All right. So moving on. Okay. So an overview of the key components of the teaching statement, it should include your future goals. Oh, let's start with your beliefs. Your beliefs, what do you think? What do you believe? What are your values when it comes to teaching? Uh, the strategies that you use to uh, enact those beliefs, make them real in the classroom, the impact, what's the effect on learners or the self uh, and the self and future goals. How will you improve your teaching going forward? So a uh, quick sort of outline here. This is one option for structuring your teaching statement. You would begin with your introduction. Uh, within the first paragraph of any teaching statement, your reader should know what your discipline is. Um, your discipline types of courses that you've taught. You should hook the reader with something memorable and personal um, that tells them something about you and briefly introduce your beliefs. Then you would have in this sort of classic five paragraph style, three or four paragraphs, one for each belief that you're highlighting. You know, one of my values is empowering students and talking about how you make that real with students, how you know it works. Start with your belief, then support with evidence of the strategies. So what you do with students and how you know it works. Examples from your practice. And then the conclusion where you summarize your main points and you tie everything back together and share your future goals. Okay. So I'm just gonna pause after this for to check out the chat, but I just want to wrap up here with some statement do's and don'ts before our next segment. So um, what not to include in your teaching statement. Uh, any sort of vague statements, every statement should have evidence and should be supported by some sort of uh, practice that you use in your teaching, right? You don't just say, I want to accomplish this. You then explain how you make that happen using strategies, techniques, um, and how you know it works based on feedback and assessment. 
Um, of course, we want to avoid any sort of negativity towards others, such as saying, you know, I don't use this strategy because it's terrible. You know, I don't lecture because it's this or that, or I don't use this strategy because of that. Um, remember that your readers may have very different pedagogical uh, strategies and values from you. So trying not to use a deficit-based framing, but rather talk about what you have witnessed working in your own teaching experience. Um, it's This is a hard one to sort of limit because there's a lot of citations that you could put in your statement if it's disciplinarily appropriate. For example, if you're an educational researcher, more citations might seem more appropriate, but you should probably not surpass a few per page. Otherwise, it begins to seem like a research paper, which it's not. It's actually a narrative about your beliefs and teaching. And then it should not be a summary of your CV. It should not be a list of the courses you've taught or the places you've taught or the kinds of courses you've taught that can come up in your teaching statement. It's important context, but it should not merely be a list of all of the things you've done. They already know that from your CV. Um, so in some, your teaching statement should be specific, positive or asset based and personal. Some key takeaways, your teaching statement should include your beliefs, your strategies to enact those beliefs, and then the impact of the strategies, how you know they work, and where you want to go, your goals. Um, you should back up your claims with rich examples from your experience. Give us a sort of uh, peek into your classroom and what it's like, what a typical class session is like, and make it personal. So I am going to uh, pass it over to Mary Catherine to present, and I'm going to take a look at the chat as well to see if I can answer some questions. Thanks, Chad. I was just trying to share some of the information we have in other places, um, and it might be helpful to put a link to our um, resource on writing teaching philosophy statements in the chat as well. Okay, um, so let's take another minute to check in um, over the chat. As long as these questions have been answered, is there anything that we haven't addressed? Yeah, I'll pause for just a second. Um, it looks like we've responded to everything I can see. Um, so we'll go on to this next step. So how do you currently assess your teaching? What evidence do you have that your teaching is effective and impactful? What, what kinds of things can you draw on as you gather your evidence for the teaching portfolio? Let's share it in the chat. Improvement on assessments. Is that for your students, Gordon? How your students have improved? Yes, that's right, sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think showing that your teaching, showing changes in um, quality of your students' work definitely shows your impact. SETs, yes, especially if you're including the written comments from your students, which is an option that we'll talk about in a minute. The mid-semester feedback um, surveys that you can do either on your own or through us, all of these are great. Um, yeah, students' placement in professional is, is a good metric, but hard to, them to quantify all the time. Um, seeing student growth, reflection, student reflections, um, See a lot of great ideas here. Surveying the students, asking for feedback, peer observation. Um, yeah, all of these are are great. And yes, if students who stay in touch and write nice things to you in emails, that's also a great a great resource to have. Metacognitive reflections. Yeah, all of these are kind of I think in some way or another can fall into our. Um, suggestions for the teaching portfolio. So um, I think we can go to the next slide. So the, the ways that you can assess your teaching and include evidence of your teaching effectiveness in your portfolio, it falls into three categories. You can self-assess, you can have a peer assessment, or you can include student assessments. Um, the, no, sorry, <laughs> uh, we'll go over each of these. So um, the 
the self-assessment options we have here are summarizing your professional development activities. Um, we're gonna go over what counts towards that in a moment. So I'll put that aside for now. The other options are annotating your um, course syllabus or course materials, um, which I will put a link to our resource on that in the chat for those of you who are interested. Um, it's, you can think of it as like explaining your thought process and why you chose the choices you made for the course, for the assignments, um, rubrics, that sort of thing, all of that can be annotated course materials. And finally, narratives of change that you made to your course. So for example, you might have inherited a course or maybe you developed a new course. How did you grow that course, change it, make it better over time? What feedback did you get from students or from peers to, um, to make those changes or what did you, uh, what kind of assessments did you do of the course to make those changes? That kind of narrative can also be very effective. So the things that can qualify as professional development activities um, are, are, oops, sorry, are um, varied. So we can have um, different forms of training that you attend. It can be directly on teaching or it might be the teaching section of your professional conferences, um, consulting with us or with others who can give you feedback on your teaching. It also involves mentorship. So if you've had formal um, supervision, if you've had people write letters of recommendation, um, it also can include fellowships, awards, the more sort of um, awards being a more, you know, external validation of your teaching. So all of these can kind of go into this catch-all category of the self-assessment of your professional development. Mary Catherine, can I just add something on that one? Sure. Yeah, so um, on the mentorship point, it can also be people who you've mentored, right? So um, whether that's students or maybe it's peer mentorship that you provided to colleagues, for example. So I also want to underline that, you know, as something that you can talk about. And then when you're, as you're thinking about like writing the currency in the field portion of your narrative, you might think about the professional development piece um, as being, um, you know, kind of the, this this is an outgrowth of that, right? So in other words, your currency in the field could be the kernel that then you can turn into a self-assessment of your professional development where you have more room to talk about your professional development if you choose this as the mechanism by which to show a self-assessment. Thank you for clarifying that connection. So um, the next area, we talked about self-assessment, the next area is peer assessment. Um, I will put a peer assessment of teaching overview link in our chat there for the CTR, CTRL resource on it. But the two areas, the two main areas we have are peer observations where you have a peer come into your course as you're teaching um, and then later give you feedback on it or you record yourself teaching and have a peer watch the recording and you know give you feedback on it or um, share your course materials with a peer and um, they can annotate it and give you feedback. So one thing I will note, um, because we get a lot of questions about it, is that the CTRL right now doesn't do um, classroom observations. We don't have the capacity for that right now. Um, we also can't help with recordings, partly out of capacity and I think partly out of technology. <laughs> um, but these are the kinds of things that if you wanna, if you're concerned about how to do them, we can certainly, um, share information. Sorry, I tried to check that link and it stopped my screen share. So I'll bring the slideshow right back. Oh, we need a new link to the teaching overview. Um, we will get that to you in a moment. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'll try to find that in a moment. Or Oh, Mac has put it in the chat. Thanks, Mac. That should be the updated peer assessments um, link. So um, the third option is for student assessments. Um, I'm also getting some 
technical issues on my end. Sorry about that, but I'll walk us through it. So the student comments from SETs is one option. So the office, the OIRA office <laughs> sends all of your numerical data from SETs automatically. You don't have to do anything for that, but you have the option of going in yourself to where your SETs live, their website, downloading the comments and sharing that as one of your um, evidence, pieces of evidence of student assessment. So those are the comments that students type in. That doesn't automatically get sent, but you can include it. And what you need to include if you do this option is all of the responses from that class. You can't pick and choose. So all of the responses, but just from one class per year that you're being assessed. So if you're applying um, for a reappointment and you've been, your last appointment was three years, you would do one course from each of those three years, all of the comments from that one course. Um, the next option is the self-administered feedback, um, student feedback surveys. So those are, um, let's see if I can find that link for you and hopefully it, um, but this link works. I'm not pulling it up. Sorry, I'm having technical issues on my um we can find that link for you as well. So the, the self-administered student feedback surveys is where you administer usually an anonymous survey. You can use Google Forms or something like that and get um, feedback from your students that way and then address that feedback in your class. So that could include um your reflection, it can include the feedback from your students that you received, the changes you made, all of those sorts of things. And then the student emails or letters, we mentioned this earlier, someone put it in the chat, but any kinds of um, things that your students have written to you about voluntarily, either during the class or afterwards, how your course has impacted them or how it's stuck with them over time, that can go, that's one option for student assessment. Um, and finally, a student discussion led by a colleague. So this is where we can help. We have our um, MCA mid-course, mid-semester course assessment process starting up soon, um, where we go into your classroom while you step out. It takes about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and, and um, talk to your students, gather feedback, we administer a survey, um, and compile that all into a report to share with you. So you can include that report. Um, I don't have the dates. I lost the dates, but you should be getting an email about that soon from CTRL. The signups um, last a couple of weeks, and then we have two weeks where we come into your class and do the MCAs. So MCAs are going to have open uh, or will be open for requests, and we'll send out an email to all faculty about that from January 29th to February 6th is when you can submit a request. And then we'll be conducting the MCAs from February 12th to the 23rd. I know this because I had to write all the messaging about it. So I, those dates are burned into my brain. Thank you. And I just pulled up, I don't know if someone else pulled up the, um, yes, I can get those up into the chat here. So, um, Perhaps survey January 9th, uh, 29th to February 6th, and then we're conducting them February 12th to 23rd. So keep an eye out. Um, our, I think our sign-up link will also be on the website. Okay. Um, a little bit more about the self-administered feedback. Um, if you decide not to have us come into your classroom because that doesn't work for you for whatever reason, uh, here's some tips for doing that feedback gathering yourself. Um, you want to keep it anonymous if your class is big enough. Of course, if you only have three or four students in your class, anonymous doesn't really work, but do your best to keep it anonymous if possible. Um, emphasize that you want feedback um, that's not just positive, but also that will help your course improve. Um, you can have your teaching assistant, graduate assistant administer the survey if you think that you'll get more honest results without you your presence. Um, 
And some questions that we recommend, at least these three, is what is helping you learn, or what are one or two things that are helping you learn, what is getting in the way of your learning, and what suggestions do you have to improve your learning in this course? So those three cover a lot and will get you very far without um, complicating things too much. And we have a um, facilitating discussion-based feedback sessions and mid-semester feedback survey guide. I would put, I think those work, hopefully they do. All right. Um, go on to the next slide. So the next thing I'll share in the chat here is um, a teaching portfolio planning document that we've put together for you. It was, um, it's just a short worksheet. It's entirely up to you if you want to use it. If it's helpful, feel free to. If not, um, that's also fine. But I'm putting a Word doc version and a PDF version um, into the chat for you all to download. Um, and lastly, we have some time for Q&A. Um, so you can think about what do you plan to include in your teaching portfolio? Which of these components do you already have? What do you still need to connect, collect? How will you be doing so? So what, what questions about all of this process do you still have? Hopefully we've answered a lot, but if you wanna either raise your hand or unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Mary Catherine, we had talked about maybe going back to the first slide that talks about the whole teaching portfolio, just to avoid any confusion, because I know we talked a lot about the teaching portion of the narrative statement and the teaching statement, and I just want to make sure that people um, aren't confused. So do you mind just going back to that? Yeah, okay. So in, in talking about this, so remember, it's all of these components, right? So you've got the comprehensive narrative that contains teaching service, currency in the field, all of them. And that's a word count related thing. Then you've got your updated CV. Then you have what's called the teaching portfolio. Inside of the teaching portfolio, you have a teaching statement. This doesn't have a word count, but we recommend one to two pages um, on this. And this is an opportunity for you to expand upon the teaching section that was in your comprehensive narrative. Then you have the supporting materials. And remember, if you're going for reappointment and promotion, or sorry, reappointment or continuing appointment without promotion as a term faculty member, you only need one of those things. If you're going for promotion as a term faculty member, you need all of those things. And if you're tenure track or tenured, you need all of those things. And then lastly, your set numerical scores, which come from um, OIRA. I will say there's one caveat to that. If you are in the College of Arts and Sciences, um, OIRA is running a pilot with you right now, in which case you will have to put in your SAT summaries. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people were clear about that as well. Antonio, I saw your question in the chat. Um, no, publications do matter. Absolutely. Publications can be part of your currency in the field. So, you know, you can you can talk about them there. Um, and, and particularly if you're on the associate professor, professor term track, they matter a great deal. Are there any other questions that people have? Again, feel free to just speak if it's easier. Oh, okay, there are a couple that just popped up. Sorry, my chat is behaving really strangely. I'm sorry. Just to restate, we are sharing these slides after, um, as mentioned in the beginning. Um, I hear uh, there's a lot of questions in the chat, but we will share the slides after the session. And then um, I'm going to uh, pause the PowerPoint so that I can share some of the links that are in the PowerPoint. Oh, I see Kendra's question here on um, CAS's pilot. Okay, so your um, your associate dean of faculty, Katie Vasico, um, will be able to tell you about it. But basically, this means that 
all faculty in CIS will be, so you get sent through um, Blue Era, all of your set summaries, all faculty do. And so they're just gonna ask you to upload those. Um, so that's for this semester and only in, um, only in CIS. Sean, you had a question around, do set scores need to be just from this past semester or can they be from all semesters within your term? Um, so yeah, so basically it depends on the period of evaluation, Sean. So um, if you're going for one year, your sets need to be for the last year. If you're going for, if you're like going for a multi-year, then it needs to be for the past three. If you're going for continuing, it needs to be for the past six. And if you have a um, course that didn't meet the threshold, then you would make sure you'd want to mention that as part of your teaching section of your narrative, that it didn't meet the threshold, but that you have some other measurements that you can point to of teaching effectiveness. Sorry, Borden? Hi, yeah, so I, I, on that, I just wanna mention that because this is the first year of continuing appointments, the truncated application for this year is specified that you only need SETs for the last two years. For the last two years? Yeah. For, for which kind of an appointment? Continuing appointment. Oh, no, that shouldn't be right. Um, for continuing, it should be six years. That's that's the standard that's going to be put in place going forward. But because this year is is sort of a, a, a compressed uh, application, because you've got, I mean, CA only came into existence in the summer. So you've got people who can scrum. So they shortened it to two years. I'm pretty sure, I mean, Chad, right? Uh, yeah, no, it really ought to be because continuing appointment would require a longer trajectory of review. Um, if it was a one-year reappointment or two-year reappointment, then it would be fine to have one or two years of sets. But um, I understand. I understand. Yeah. But because this year was a special year, they truncated it to two. Hmm. Okay. I'd love to know more about that. I'll I'll check with Katie on that, your AD. Great. And I'm and sorry if I'm, wrong, I'm... if I'm wrong, please tell me. <laughs> No, absolutely. Well, either way, that you know, your faculty coordinator will tell you what you need um, to put into your file. Um, so, and then in addition, you will have the checklist, you know, that we have on the Dean of Faculty website, and that your faculty coordinator share with you, depending on your faculty action. That should have all the instructions in it. Um, but yeah, if there's any confusion, I will check with Katie. I'll ask her about that. And you said con continuing appointment in CAS is only looking at the past two years. SPA, yeah. Oh, SPA, I'm sorry, SPA past two years. Okay, no, that's, I gotta make sure. And that's not Katie then, that's actually Dave. Okay. All right, let me check on that then. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed anything in the chat. Um, were there other questions that I missed, Shad or Mary Catherine, or ones that you've already answered? I was just scrolling through <laughs> to see what I can find. Um, I don't know if we answered Anne's question. If my SETs are several several years old and will not have new ones until this spring, what would you suggest as the best substitute? Uh, what kind of appointment are you going up for? For term faculty. For, for, for one year. Just reappointment for one year. Oh, one year reappointment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's a good question. So if you don't have any recent sets, hmm, I would actually ask your unit what they would like you to do in order to provide that information because, you know, they might say do something a little bit more robust in terms of teaching effectiveness, but um, but I don't want to answer for them because this is an unusual case. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, if your sets are from when you're an adjunct, is this for a one-year reappointment? Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Then you would basically bring in your adjunct SET scores. Another question. Can we give the word count for the comprehensive narrative for the continuing appointment with promotion? That's the word count. Oh, sorry. Oh, I keep doing thanks, that. It's, 20, it's 2250. I believe the 30. Thank you. You're welcome. If your question hasn't been answered, please just remind us in the chat so we can see it again, just because we have a ton of messages. 
Um, but once again, I want to uh, say that we will send the slides in a follow up and that a recording, the recording that of this workshop will be available on the CTRL archive. Just give us a little while to put it up on the archive itself. Um, and uh, Lindsay has shared an evaluation link in the chat so you can let us know um, how this session went for you and how our work can be improved for the future. Um, we're going to stick around for another few minutes for the questions that you might have. Um, but uh, Priya, Mary Catherine, thoughts before we move on to our final slides? I don't have any. No, I hope that um, people aren't walking away confused. But if you are, you can always just reach out. Please do feel free to reach out to me. It's just doshi at american.edu. Um, Thank you. So because of our limited time, I think we're just going to move to our uh, our uh, contact information here. Um, so we've got uh, our um, link for uh, requesting a consult, our short link, and then our teaching portfolio guide, which we've also shared a few times in the chat, um, and the Beyond SCT guidance and our resources. We have expansive resources online about building a teaching portfolio and all the different components of it that we talked about today. And, and other questions with asking about the continuing appointment without promotion, it's the same word count. It's 2,250 for, yeah, multi-year, any multi-year. All right. So I see that some folks are heading out. So if you have to move on to... Uh, whatever is next in your schedule, please feel free. Thank you for joining us. If you want to hang around, I think I can hang around for another few minutes. Um, Priya and Mary Catherine, um, sounds good. So we'll be here for a few minutes for your other questions or thoughts. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. It was really helpful. Thanks, Bill.